And now, Chapter 2, A Seaman's Daily Work, from Richard Henry Dana Jr.'s Two Years Before the Mast. As we had now a long spell of fine weather, without any incident to break the monotony of our lives, there can be no better place to describe the duties, regulations, and customs of an American merchantman, of which ours was a fair specimen. The captain, in the first place, is Lord Paramount. He stands no watch, comes and goes when he pleases, and is accountable to no one, and must be obeyed in everything. He has the power to turn his officers off duty, and even to make them do duty as sailors in the forecastle. The prime minister, the official organ, and the active and superintending officer is the chief mate. The captain tells him what he wishes to have done, and leaves to him the care of overseeing, of allotting the work, and also the responsibility of its being well done. The mate also keeps the logbook for which he is responsible to the owners and insurers, and has the charge of the stowage, safekeeping, and delivery of the cargo. The second mate is proverbially a dog's berth. The men do not respect him as an officer, and he is obliged to go aloft to reef and furl the topsails, and to put his hands into the tar and slush with the rest. The crew call him the sailor's waiter, as he has to furnish them with spun yarn, marline, and all other stuffs that they need in their work, and has charge of the boatswain's locker which includes serving boards, marline spikes, etc. His wages are usually double those of a common sailor, and he eats and sleeps in the cabin. But he is obliged to be on deck nearly all his time, and eats at the second table, that is, makes a meal out of what the captain and chief mate leave. The steward is the captain's servant, and has charge of the pantry from which everyone, even the mate himself, is excluded. The cook is the patron of the crew, and those who are in his favor can get their wet mittens and stockings dried, or light their pipes at the galley in the night watch. These two worthies, together with the carpenter and sailmaker, if there be one, stand no watch, but being employed all day are allowed to sleep in at night unless all hands are called. The crew are divided into two watches. Of these, the chief mate commands the larboard, and the second mate the starboard. They divide the time between them, being on and off duty, or on deck and below, every other four hours. If, for instance, the chief mate with the larboard watch have the first night watch from 8 to 12, at the end of the four hours the starboard watch is called, and the second mate takes the deck, while the larboard watch and the first mate go below until 4 in the morning, when they come on deck again and remain until 8, having what is called the morning watch. As they will have been on deck eight hours out of the twelve, while those who had the middle watch from twelve to four will only have been up four hours, they have what is called a forenoon watch below, that is, from 8 a.m. till 12 m. An explanation of the dog watches may, perhaps, be of use to one who has never been at sea. They are to shift the watches each night, so that the same watch need not be on deck at the same hours. In order to effect this, the watch from 4 to 8 p.m. is divided into two half or dog watches, one from 4 to 6, and the other from 6 to 8. By this means, they divide the 24 hours into seven watches instead of six, and thus shift the hours every night. As the dog watches come during twilight, after the day's work is done, and before the night watch is set, they are the watches in which everybody is on deck. At eight o'clock, eight bells are struck, the log is hove, the watch set, the wheel relieved, the galley shut up, and the other watch goes below. The morning commences with the watch on decks turning to at daybreak, and washing down, scrubbing, and swabbing the decks. This, with filling the scuttled butt with fresh water and coiling up the rigging, usually occupies the time until seven bells, half past seven, when all hands get breakfast. At eight, the day's work begins and lasts until sundown, with the exception of an hour for dinner. The discipline of the ship requires every man to be at work upon something when he is upon deck, except at night and on Sundays. It is the officer's duty to keep everyone at work, even if there is nothing to be done but to scrape the rust from the chain cables. No conversation is allowed among the crew at their duty, and though they frequently do talk when aloft or when near one another, yet they always stop when an officer is nigh. When I first left port and found that we were kept regularly employed for a week or two, I supposed that we were getting the vessel into sea trim and that it would soon be over, and we should have nothing to do but to sail the ship. But I found that it continued so for two years, and at the end of two years there was as much to be done as ever. When first leaving port, studding sail gear is to be rove, 
all the running rigging to be examined, that which is unfit for use to be got down, and new rigging rove in its place. Then the standing rigging is to be overhauled, replaced, and repaired in a thousand different ways. And wherever any of the numberless ropes or the yards are chafing or wearing upon it, their chafing gear, as it is called, must be put on. Taking off, putting on, and mending the chafing gear alone upon a vessel would find constant employment for two or three men during working hours for a whole voyage. All the small stuffs which are used on board a ship, such as spun yarn, marline, seizing stuff, etc., are made on board. The owners of a vessel buy up incredible quantities of old junk, which the sailors unlay after drawing out the yarns, knot them together, and roll them up in balls. These rope yarns are used for various purposes, but the greater part is manufactured into spun yarn. For this purpose, every vessel is furnished with a spun yarn winch, which is very simple, consisting of a wheel and spindle. Another method of employing the crew is setting up rigging. Whenever any of the standing rigging becomes slack, which is continually happening, the seizings and coverings must be taken off, tackles got up, and after the rigging is bowsed well taut, the seizings and coverings replaced, which is a very nice piece of work. If we add to this all the tarring, greasing, oiling, varnishing, painting, scraping, and scrubbing, which is required in the course of a long voyage, and also remember that this is all to be done in addition to watching at night, steering, reefing, furling, bracing, making, and setting sail, and pulling, hauling, and climbing in every direction, one will hardly ask, what can a sailor find to do at sea? If, after all this labor, the merchants and captains think that they have not earned their twelve dollars a month and their salt beef and hard bread, they keep them picking oakum ad infinitum. I have seen oakum stuff placed about in different parts of the ship so that the sailors might not be idle in the snatches between the frequent squalls upon crossing the equator. Some officers have been so driven to find work for the crew of a ship ready for sea that they have set them to pounding the anchors and scraping the chain cables. The Philadelphia Catechism is, Six days shalt thou labor, and do all thou art able, and on the seventh holy stone the decks, and scrape the cable.